Welcome to uh, the last um, uh, panel of this uh, symposium. Uh, thank you so much again for uh, sticking around and for joining us. Uh, I will just uh, briefly introduce uh, Bill Belaskus, who will be moderating this conversation, and is also the co-editor of Institution as Praxis, New Curatorial Directions for Collaborative Research. So we, we edited this publication together. And I will let uh, Bill introduce the panel. I will just briefly, as I said, introduce uh, Bill. Bill is an artist, theorist, and educator, uh, uh, currently associate professor and director of research, business, and innovation at the School of Art and Architecture of Kingston University in London. Thank you so much, Bill, for being here as well. And I will hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Carolina, and thank you both to um, you and to uh, Anthony for the kind invitation to be uh, with you today um, amongst such um, a group of esteemed colleagues, but also um, a new generation of, of researchers, which is really, really exciting, very relevant to uh, the scope of the uh, publication. So I will be very brief in introducing certain points around the publication. Uh, I believe that um, the, my personal contribution to the publication has been shared, so um, I won't refer to, to that in particular. We can perhaps discuss uh, some aspects or questions that you might have at the end. Uh, so I will refer to, in general to the publication some uh, of what I consider to be the key uh, findings of, of it. Uh, and then uh, I will ask from contributors to uh, briefly describe how they responded to our invitation to contribute and also uh, to um, uh, talk a little bit about their essay uh, contribution. Uh, so I will start by saying that uh, institution as praxis uh, adopted as a starting point, something that is both um, sounds quite simple, but actually has quite a lot of complexities, which is the assertion that universities are not the only sites where knowledge is produced, which sounds, as I said, quite simple, but actually um, it hides quite, quite a lot of uh, debates, discourses, uh, problems of different types uh, behind it. And the problems often uh, originate from the fact that academia is still in charge of determining the uh, what's and the how's of collaborative research projects. And we are very much reliant on the mechanisms of academia when it comes to how we validate uh, research and collaboration. And also um, something that has already been mentioned, something that um, Emily mentioned in her talk as well, the whole idea of the case study approach, the whole idea of the project approach. But in the last few years, uh, we're seeing increasingly also a reverse challenge, which is that cultural workers are uh, questioning the validation protocols of uh, knowledge, product, knowledge production academia, um, which means that the, um, the landscape is in um, very, very quickly changing um, situation. So the aim of the publication has been to identify nascent practices and to advocate for actually multiplicity of practices uh, of knowledge production taking place in the cultural sector uh, that go beyond the uh, delivery of, of cultural activities, like for instance, exhibitions or uh, events. So what we were interested in was to look at how knowledge is produced beyond academia in the cultural institutions, not just through the, the traditional activities of those institutions. Um, so the book includes um, research-led cultural organizations. It includes uh, essays focusing on cultural programming in collaboration with um, higher education institutions, but also research-led curating. And I should say that curating is used um, as quite an expanded term in the publication, the sense that we have not just curators um, who are writing about curating, but also we have artists who are curating their own work, but also the work of communities, the work of um, different types of organizations, and so on and so forth. Um, Carolina is going to talk, I believe, a little bit about the background of the book, how the book came to be. Uh, but I'm going to spend two or three minutes talking a little bit about the um, uh, 
main what I think are the main findings or what I found personally more more interested uh, interesting through the process of working with Carolina on this publication. Um, so one of the elements that I found particularly interesting was the fact that both the higher education institutions and um, the cultural sector has been extraordinarily resilient throughout the difficulties that they have faced over the last um, two to three decades, uh, in particular following the uh, financial crisis of 2008, the Great Recession period, and it's really interesting that once again we are in a crisis mode. Um, so uh, what happened following the Great Recession um, it can give us a lot of food for thought about how we might end up dealing with the current crisis. Um, beyond that, uh, there has been, I think, an increased, increased focus uh, by cultural institutions on the production and dissemination of the commons through research uh, projects whose reach and impact may be strengthened further through collaborative strategies. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, the challenges and opportunities for both sectors are, uh, it seems, both vertical and horizontal. So we have different types of higher education institutions, teaching intensive and research intensive, and also different types of cultural institutions with or without collections, local, regional, national, um, with different models of funding, income generation. We have artist-run spaces, non-profit, research-driven, event-driven, uh, disciplinary specific, and the list can go on and on actually. Uh, and despite all those differences, there are also very important commonalities that are often being ignored due to the lack of systematic dialogue and uh, documentation. And although practice-based research is being increasingly important in higher education institutions, not all types of practice research and methodologies are actually viewed in equal terms or explored in full. And the transferability of practice methodologies uh, remains uh, quite often low. Um, also, the changes that networked communications have brought to knowledge production have been affected the way in which institutional or, if you like, formal knowledge production and dissemination are perceived by cultural workers, the public and academics themselves. And then I think a final point, uh, which I found really um, interesting and relevant to um, current debates, is that uh, there are multiple historical collaborative models uh, which have been under theorized and quite often such initiatives were considered as being um, avant-garde perhaps at the time and can only, can only now be uh, appreciated thanks to uh, increased connectivity as well as renewed appetite for um, alternative formats of cultural praxis. And this includes very much models stemming from regions that have been uh, systematically ignored by the global north. Um, so that's my personal take on the publication, if you like, um, and some food for thought, perhaps, for the discussion that we follow. Uh, so I will start by asking from Carolina uh, to talk a little bit about um, her view on the book from the point um, of um, uh, the wider context within which it was uh, born. Um, and what is the actual background of, um, of the publication? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, just to show the cover, I mean, uh, just to have an image at least of the publication here today, since we didn't have any other uh, visuals to share. Um, so, so yeah, just very quickly, because I would love to hear from the from all the contributors here today with us. And it's quite a special uh, occasion because we never had so many uh, also with us in, in, in public uh, conversations. So definitely to uh, to hear from them. Just to say that institution as praxis before it became a tat the title of this publication, it was a, a program I initiated at Nottingham Contemporary when I was head of public programs and research uh, at Nottingham Contemporary, which is a contemporary arts center in Nottingham in the UK. Um, and the idea was really to, to ask the question around what is research in uh, outside of academia, acknowledging that there are so many ways, and we discussed, I think, uh, about this today throughout the event, so many other ways of 
of producing knowledge that are not only the ones that fall within the protocols of academic knowledge uh, in uh, um, higher education institutions. So it was a way of mapping, uh, let's say, uh, uh, different methodologies and research driven practices coming from uh, not only artists, but also curators and, you know, in another way also from cultural institutions in terms of their approach to programming. Um, and so not only to map, but also to develop it inside, uh, not in contemporary, uh, these research strands that was the title, Institution as Praxis, that would allow us to uh, not only have a self-reflective approach to the work we were doing to establish what I call the infrastructure, the curatorial infrastructures for a research-led program, uh, but also for us to be able to program a series of activities that would investigate, uh, also query what those potentials were. And so uh, the publication came as a kind of a continuation of that inquiry uh, and also a possibility for me to work with Bill uh, to invite colleagues that are working in related ways, as Bill explained now, related ways to these questions coming from uh, colleagues, academics, practitioner researchers, as Emily would name it, practitioners, researchers, but also from uh, colleagues that are leading institutions or programming international uh, curatorial programs. So it was a bit of a combination of getting kind of the sense of what's going on and hopefully to have these contributions also contributing to the discussions that are happening to get, uh, today in academia, especially in relation to practice research, how these methodologies could then be contributes directly and feedback, let's say, to the ways we understand research currently in academia. Okay, everything for me, I think uh, there's more in the publication. We are sharing uh, the PDFs of the contributions uh, that contributors also very generously accepted to, to share. Um, and I, uh, back to you, uh, Bill. Thank you very much, Carolina, for uh, enriching the context uh, that I've um, described in the beginning. Um, so as, as uh, we mentioned um, we would uh, like to take advantage of this rare opportunity to have so many of our contributors today uh, with us in order to hear from them about how they responded to um, the invitation and what are the key points in their contribution and how they relate to um, the subject of today's um, event. Uh, so I will ask from each one of the contributors to briefly talk about how they responded and the essay they uh, contributed, uh, perhaps three to four minutes so that we also uh, have uh, enough time at the end to open up the discussion. Um, so I would like to start from uh, Michael, uh, Michael Burschel, uh, who um, is a curator at Migros Museum um, and from 2016 until 2020 was a creator of public practice, Tate Liverpool, and a senior lecturer at the, the Liverpool School of Art and Design, uh, where he's currently a visiting uh, fellow. So, uh, Michael, if you could uh, talk about uh, your response and your essay, uh, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you for the um, introduction. Yeah, I mean, I was approached, I think, initially uh, to contribute by Carolina because I had um, my previous post was a joint um, appointment between Tate and between uh, a university. So um, I, I was I was doing what, what everyone was talking about in terms of bridging this gap between higher education and a, and a public institution. And I think um, for me, the opportunity to write the essay was um, taken as a, a moment to reflect on some of the, the program that I'd been curating at Tate and how this was underpinned by my research as a, um, Art historian of sorts and um, this notion of publicness that was very much present in my uh, research at that time and at what kind of coincided with that was that at Tate they'd recently started a project called Tate Exchange which is a uh, it's a space but it's also a platform for um, exchanges with with audiences and I had the chance to to program quite a lot of activity in there with uh, with artists, with academics, with with researchers, with um, different people from different options as well, and it became apparent that um, you know I previously curated exhibitions, but this 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 project, this curatorial platform of Taste Exchange, was 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 a new a new way of working that that was neither an exhibition 
nor a kind of educational program. So somewhere in between a kind of para institutional model. Um, and I basically used this to um, reflect on some practices that I had worked on with various artists. And then I kind of put together a sort of list um, in order to define what this actually means by public practice, um, which was my job title at Tate. And I think, at this point, I'd, I'd, I'd um, convinced myself what I was doing effectively inside the institution, but also wanted to have a moment to reflect with other peers and scholars internationally who have similar roles and also uh, looking more critically at what does public practice actually mean? I mean, it's, it's, it's still a term that I'm quite critical of, but I think it certainly fits uh, some um, institutions and some curators. I would say at Tate, it was probably at this time um, a little bit undervalued and not really understood within the institution. And I think part of the problem again, as maybe Emily would attest to from her talk, is that there's, there's, there's a kind of um, uh, misunderstanding around how research fits within an organization and what curators should and shouldn't be doing. And certainly in my in my own practice, this is always uh, encompassed elements of public discourse. It's very uh, important to my, my work. I, I don't believe that curators operate as single authors. We, we usually converse and collaborate with other academics and indeed artists, but also if you're working within a public institution, you have this sort of duty of care to uh, listen to your uh, colleagues and other researchers within within the museum. And at, at this particular time, I think the program at uh, Tate Exchange, Tate Liverpool, was really trying to do something new. Uh, but still, there, there was a bit of hesitancy from my colleagues, like, why are you inviting an artist to do a performance in the gallery? Why is it not part of the exhibition on the main floor? Um, this kind of idea of like institutional hierarchy was 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 very much at play. Um, and I, I think listening to the responses today and also from, from Emily's talk, it's also for me uh, allowed me to reflect on my my current role uh, at the Migos Museum for Gegenwartskunst in, in Zurich and how the notion of, of publicness and uh, public engagement is is quite distinctly different from a UK perspective. Um, the whole the the nature of public in museum and the way that engagement is done with audiences is through Vermittlung in German or mediation in in English. And um, but we're kind of in this transitionary phase where we're trying to adopt some of those, as my colleagues say, Anglo-Saxon models of working. Um, and another area that I'm thinking about at the moment is, is this collaboration with, with higher education, which is visible and it, and it is apparent within the Swiss museum sector, but it's not at the same level it is in the UK. So I'm trying to ensure that we have PhD researchers within the museum that also help us in the work that we do, but also enrich our knowledge because I think also what one of the biggest problems is that we we one really struggles to find the time in order to carry out uh, research within the museum. But Emily's model of practitioner research definitely applies to my work. But it's still there's still a, a model of kind of catching up and trying to uh, tap into those recent debates and topics which you need to be aware of. So I think that's okay for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That's great. Um, we're going to keep the fast pace of this section, and we are going to uh, move to Sean Vaughan, uh, who is uh, a reader in research practice at Birmingham City University with uh, expertise in doctoral education and creative research methods. Hello, Sean. Hello, thank you. Um, thinking about how I responded to the um, invite to contribute to the, the publication. I suppose I started off by thinking about my own position. I've been in higher education for far too many years, but I've never stayed in higher education. Um, with the roles I've had, originally an art historian, looking after a collection, but in a contemporary art school, 
and looking after collections to do with public art. I've moved between the archive, the gallery, the museum and the education worlds constantly. And I started to think about these sort of hierarchies that are implicit between all of that. And there's nothing more hierarchical than a higher education institution. And I'm not comfortable with hierarchies. And I realized that a lot of my colleagues in the School of Art are also not within one part of this than another. You know, they're, they're professional artists as well. They're exhibitors, they're curators, it's known as dual professionals in some responses. But it made me think about whether there was this dichotomy and binary between higher education and the cultural sector that the two needed to be bring to, brought together or whether there was more porosity in this. And I used a concept of Celia Whitchurch's um, a third space professional and the power academic. Um, universities think a lot in terms of academic or professional service, and that's a really problematic hierarchical positioning. Um, and thinking about the third space and the power academic and how these things could be blurred and how research could fit with that also got me to thinking about how both the cultural sector and the art world and the academic research world tend to be very individual focused and yet the most exciting research is collaborative so thinking through institution as praxis rather than the emphasis on the individual um, encouraged me to think through how we think and talk about research in an academic setting, but how that same language is just as applicable in other settings. Um, it's not that it needs to be translated. We just need to let go of some of our assumptions. So I took a particular project that's relevant to um, the Midlands region um, that had happened um, that had more than one individual driving it and worked through in reflecting on that project, how the academic criteria for research in terms of contribution, of rigour, of significance, of dissemination in terms of um, sharing, reflecting back to what Michael said this morning, sort of expositionality, publication as the realisation of the work and not of the clo of closed endpoint of the work. So I found it a really interesting process for myself just to think through my own position and work that through in an essay for other people. Great, thank you very much, Sean. That's great. Um, we've heard um, Emily Pringle's uh, great talk, but um, I'm going to ask her to uh, perhaps repeat some of the things you mentioned uh, through a different lens, which is slight or slightly different lens, which is the lens of the publication. Um, so as, as uh, you know, Emily is the head of research at Tate since 2019. Um, so Emily, if you could talk a little bit about um, how um, you, um, you you thought of responding to the publication um, and perhaps uh, connecting it uh, with the general context of what we have been discussing today. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, and thank you again. I mean, I, I, I really welcomed the opportunity to, to contribute. And as I said in my talk, the, the, the area that I really wanted to focus on was this notion of, of trust. And in particular, I've been looking at these um, theories around what constitutes professionalism and how do you define a professional? I was trying to interrogate what is a practitioner, what is a professional? And, and at times the two are kind of interconnected. And I was really interested in this kind of model of the professional as, as someone who has specialist knowledge, um, which they have a responsibility to employ for the greater good. Uh, uh, but, but because society sees them as having that knowledge, they're, they're imbued with a huge amount of trust and given a lot of autonomy to carry on doing what they're doing. Um, and, um, uh, but, but they also have responsibility. So it's this kind of these four characteristics of knowledge, autonomy, trust and responsibility. And I was really interested in the context of the publication to think about how that can be applied to the notion of the curator and um, and the extent to which curators uh, fulfill those criteria of the kind of professional, but also how um, in relation to this kind of model of the practitioner researcher, which I was developing, how actually some of those characteristics are really problematic in today's museum, not uh, and most um, immediately this notion of autonomy 
Uh, so I'm really interested in what Sean's just said, and I was busy writing down all para-academic. I must have a good old look at that. Um, uh, and that sense that um, going forward, the the uh, the that it is vital that actually um, the curator uh, establishes trust not through being autonomous, but actually through constantly reflecting and making visible uh, that reflection or manifesting that critical reflection on their own practice with others that that is more relevant to how museum professionals need to work and that and locating that within a research process is 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 a kind of positive and um, realistic way for the for the for the curator for the curator to work going forward so so that was kind of what I was interested to explore in the essay that's great thank you very much um, and Finally, I will move to um, Anthony. Um, as you know, Anthony Downey is a professor of visual culture in the Middle East and North Africa at Birmingham City University. And once again, um, Anthony, the same question to you. Um, I, I can, don't think I can see whether you are online at the moment. Hopefully you are. Um, okay, great. Um, uh, so the same question to you, really. How how uh, did you perceive the invitation um, in terms of the subject area of the book, and um, um, what what led you to to write about the the, the subject that you wrote, really? Mm. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Carolina. Um, in fact, I went back and reread uh, the essay in, in preparation for this. I, I don't know about you, Bill, but I, I always it, it fills me with horror when you go back and reread something. You always find something in it. But I utilized the opportunity uh, to put together a, an overview of three artists that I was working with as part of uh, my practice research practice series with Sternberg Press. And those three artists were Lara Baladi, who is volume four of the series, Trevor Paglin, who is volume six of the series, and Heba Wayamin, who is volume two. And effectively, what I was trying to do with the essay, and in rereading it, I probably rushed a, li a little, was ask a very simple question. Um, how have digital technologies recalibrated our relationship to present day historical events? And, and expand beyond that and ask how they have recalibrated our relationship to historical consciousness. And the question was compounded, I guess, by the fact that um, these digital technologies often work in a very recursive fashion they're based upon uh, black box technologies, deep neural networks, algorithmic rationalizations that inevitably create a sort of mise en abime, a very impenetrable system, which is very difficult to enter into. And yet these systems have huge ramifications, not only upon how we understand present day historical event, but what our memory or future memory of present day events will be. So I think working with these three artists helped me a lot and uh, going back to the points we were making earlier, how do you think from within practice? And what I wanted to do with that essay was formulate a methodology for how these artists think within the apparatus of digital technology to deconstruct precisely these black box systems. And you can think about Lara Baladi's engagement with the events of Tahrir Square in 2011, how she's utilized that as an opportunity to create a digital archive of um, iconography associated with global revolution. Equally, uh, thinking about Trevor Paglin uh, from Apple to Autonomy, a project I uh, was involved with with Trevor for the Barbican in, I think, 2019. And following up with Trevor on a number of occasions and now towards this book that we're publishing in relation to how, the, how algorithms are defining issues around racial determinism, reinscribing all of the colonial apparatus but reinscribing it in an even more insidious way uh, as if there is an inevitability to it. But the one artist who really sort of, because I've just spent nine months working with her uh, for a show I curated at the Mosaic Rooms was Heba Amin. And something quite extraordinary happened with the work that we were developing with Heba, not just as part of her book, but as part of her show, um, because she created the work called Speak to Tweet, which is an archive of voices from Tahrir Square in 2011 which she revisited 10 years later. And during that moment, of course, what has happened since 2011 is the purging of voices from 
the internet, a sort of digital colonization or a colonial digitalism or digital authoritarianism, which is literally purging voices. Now, as we were presenting this recently, uh, we had events in Gaza. Uh, so on the 10th of May, you had the attack by the IDF on Alaska Mosque. On the 11th of May, you had 10 days of bombing of Gaza. At that precise moment that we were discussing this, coming out of this essay, coming out of the book, coming out of this question about um, how we accessed uh, historical events, there was a complicit purging by Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook of hashtags associated with Alaska Mosque and indeed the bombing of Gaza. And in that moment, just thinking about what I'd set out to do and how this had almost came full circle, Bill, was quite sort of, um, I want to use the word chilling, but it was chilling, it was sobering, in as much as the reality of those events as they were unfolding was literally being re-inscribed, rewritten, and indeed eradicated. So for example, going forward, if we need to go back to those events and understand what they are, we will not find social media records of them, or what we will find is a highly distorted version of that. And the point I will make, it was thinking through Heba's practice in association with my research that helped me to articulate what those recursive systems are doing. And again, this goes back to the point we were talking about earlier. How do you think through digital methodologies, digital apparatuses, which seem all pervasive, but in reality, we need an entry point. We need a critical point of entry in order to deconstruct how they are controlling, not just our present, but indeed controlling our future or potentially annexing our futures. So it's great for me to go back and look at the essay. Uh, there was a degree of continuity. If I had my time all over again, I would write a very different essay, but I think it would pick up on those specifics, i.e. what are digital technologies doing to our relationship to history itself. Thanks, Bill. Thank you very much, Anthony. That's great. Um, and I think it's it's really it was really interesting to hear uh, all your um, responses because it was um, quite um, quite evident that certain themes were were um, recurring and starting from uh, how you finished, Anthony, uh, talking about um, an issue that also Emily touched upon, which is the issue of trust. How can we be functioning as cultural workers uh, and as professionals uh, who um, can be trusted by the public if the uh, basis on which we're working is so um, uh, volatile, really, and uh, making sure that we respond to those issues in a way that is uh, not just trustworthy, but also uh, does really justice to uh, the way in which the role of um, or cultural institutions and cultural workers is being seen or should be seen. Uh, and it was really interesting also for me to hear um, about this notion of reflection, starting from Michael, who talked about the opportunity to, to um, reflect through writing the, uh, the essay, time to take, um, take a break from, from uh, his work uh, in order to reflect on the notion of publicness and what does public practice mean and how does research fit within within that and what does it mean to be mediating um really which can be also um obscure uh, well obscured and also um delimited by um the hierarchies that exist in our institutions just like sean mentioned how important hierarchies are in the way in which we uh we do our work we do what we we think is right um and um i mean that, that's those are just some very quick points around um, what, what has been um, mentioned. Um, I think we have time to obviously take questions from um, colleagues who are present um, to talk about the uh, publication, if you have any specific questions about the publication, but also I believe there's also time, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Carolina, uh, to uh, use what has been said in this last part of the day in order to expand the discussion um, that we had earlier. Great, so if, I don't know if we have any questions uh, either to specific authors or uh, general comments. I would say that probably, uh, Anthony, we have uh, until four, um, and then uh, if uh, we can start closing the session after four, um, that would be ideal. Great. 
Um, I think we have a question from Rob. Um, does not contemplation and reflection need time and space? Does it need to be more challenging to rework? Uh, every blow uh, the maker strikes is with the knowledge that a revision is harder to achieve. Every physical blow is made with a physical sacrifice that is harder to undo. Does technology have the power to make decision making to matter of fact? Um, I think it has particular relevance to um, the final um, comment that you made, Anthony. So um, I don't know whether you'd like to um, respond to that. Thanks, Rob. Um, thanks, Bill. Uh, not necessarily, but I would just say in relation to Rob's final point, does technology have the power to make decision making to matter of fact? Yes, absolutely. But there is a danger here that we get involved with a notion of technological determinism, as, um, as if somehow technology has usurped our agency. This is hugely problematic, uh, something I struggle with. And I would suggest that we need to rethink that technological determinism, the way in which social media operates, for example, the way in which it operates in a political context, and reconsider the following. Um, technology is not an addendum. It's not a supplement to our being. It is imbricated within our very ontology. It is, to all intents and purposes, predicating our being in the world. So it's not a matter of taking control of technology. It's not a matter of bad technology. It's not a matter of good technology. It's not even a matter of technology making it easier to pull a trigger or technology making it easier to affect surveillance or drone surveillance. It's a question of understanding how technology is ontological and predicates the self. And take it from that starting point, I think we can reorient ourselves around what we understand by contemporary forms of technology. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, I cannot see any more questions in the chat, uh, but you can also raise your hand if you like uh, in order to ask a question. We have, I think, two or three more minutes before we move to the final uh, part of the day. Bill, can I ask you a question? Sure, yeah, please do. So, because you started out on this process with Carolina quite some time ago, and because we have had the hiatus, of the pandemic and so forth. I use the word hiatus advisedly. I mean, what have you learned from the book? Because effectively we're now in such a different space, um, conceptually, historically, economically, socially. I mean, what have you learned from the book? What lessons have you drawn from that engagement across so many different topics? Um, I think that, um, I'll, I'll, I think I'll return to, to one of the points I've made uh, in the beginning, which is, um, around those commonalities between different types of organizations and the common challenges that we're facing. Um, mm. And it's particularly relevant, for instance, um, to the this notion of time to reflect time, the, the colonization of time through um, both HEIs and in the cultural sector. Um, when um, I, I was talking to colleagues coming from both universities and the cultural sector, uh, there's a constant um, um, argument that uh, arises, which has to do with how um, everybody is overworked, overstretched, and have no time to reflect. And it only seems that during the pandemic, this has become uh, worse. Um, the situation in academia uh, has become much worse. Uh, so the um, commonalities became even more apparent, I think. Uh, and obviously in the cultural sector, we're seeing a lot of organizations struggling to survive. Um, I think it will become really evident with universities too, very soon, especially, I should say, specialist institutions, smaller institutions, institutions that focus mainly on the arts and the humanities. And I think as Carolina mentioned earlier, um, I think it might have been during Emily's uh, talk uh, and discussion, uh, the pandemic has been a catalyst that has um, helped um, developments that had already been um, functioning, really, or, or um, elements that have been already developing to become uh, much quicker in their growth. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I think that that's what we're seeing at the moment. We're seeing the attitude of the current government towards uh, the arts and humanities. Uh, if the cuts that are being proposed materialize, uh, it's going to be totally devastating. Obviously, we know that this didn't come out of the blue. We know that even before the pandemic, uh, and as yeah, a lot of um, the contributors to the book wrote, uh, there has been a continuous attack on um, the arts and humanities and cultural institutions. And uh, that's why I talked also about the resilience. We have been really resilient during the previous crisis. The question is, how will we be able to respond even more quickly and in a more consistent manner to the current crisis? Because it seems that what is at stake is even um, more uh, important now. Um, it's perhaps our very survival. So I think taking the um, conclusions from the practices that are being investigated in the book and making sure that we quickly um, learn those lessons. I think that's the main thing I'm taking from, from the book because we are indeed in a very deep crisis for the arts and humanities, I think very much in this country, but um, probably um, across the world really. So that's what I would say. Sounds like you've talked yourself into volume two. <laughs> well, uh, not quite yes. yet, but 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 I think we have a very fertile ground. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Will. I don't, uh, Michael. Do you have? Do you have? You raised your hands. So yeah, wonder... I just I just raised my hand. Yeah, I I just think. Um, yeah, when I like departed the UK last year, um, you know, one of the one of the reasons was really like. Do I want to continue working in this landscape where uh, culture and the humanities are just uh, constantly being attacked by by right wing parties and governments? And you know, is this this constant survival, this constant uh, searching for resources? And and you know, it's like as a as a cultural producer do I do I want to remain in this nexus for the rest of my working life and the answer was no and and you know I of course I, this comes from a position of privilege in that I've been able to relocate to a different model of of, of working but but um it, it just it, it, it became a real struggle it became really kind of undermining the work that people do and at the same time you know I, I I see my colleagues and my friends across the UK working in in small NPOs in museums in universities and they're so committed to what they do and and how they operate and people are resistant against what's happening with the right-wing government but it's uh, it's quite bleak to say but I think in some cases, some small institutions should actually just resist the changes and and reduce what they do. They they you cannot sustain this level of programming on limited resources. You can't invest less and then ask for the same amount of output. It's just it's just not possible. And you know, it's it's one of the perils of like neoliberalism that everybody has to work harder all the time. But I just think that there has to be a, another alternative. I think you're absolutely right, Michael. And uh, I think that um, uh, one of the lessons that I think we we might have learned from the book, but also from the from the uh, financial crisis of 2008 and the Great Recession, is uh, that we should be or should have been much more um, aggressive, and we should have said no to many things much earlier. Um, and um, I think that's something that, um, in a way, um, we um, has put us in an even more precarious position at the moment. Um, so resisting through those uh, to those changes is very important, and, and um, even questioning the very notion of um, why those changes are needed, or what is the very the very the very basis or the very um, direction. Um, I know it's not a very um, positive note to finish this part of the conversation, but at the same time, I think it is important to be raising those issues because we, they, it's something that is we will find in front of us very, very quickly. So it's better to be prepared than peacefully. Um, 
I think we have at five minutes past four. So uh, probably um, Carolina and Anthony, we can move to uh, the last part of the day. Uh, I would just like to say again, um, thank you to all the contributors and also thank you to Carolina and Anthony uh, for inviting me today. Thank you everyone as well. Thank you so much. Anthony, over to you. Yeah. Well, I, Carolina, I was more inclined to sort of suggest that we wrap up on that note because effectively I think it returns us to our earlier points about how these commonalities of interests are now converging under very, very serious conditions of precarity for everyone. And of course, anybody outside of universities working outside of the cultural sector or indeed working in uh, precarious positionalities would be feeling this even more than we are. So effectively, uh, thinking through these issues, again, through our doctoral training programs, thinking through research, thinking through practice, is inevitably going to involve some long hard looks at what we do, how we do it, why we do it, and who ultimately benefits from these practices and in these, these critical debates. But uh, I'm happy to hand over to you, Carolina, for your uh, final comments. Thank you so much, Anthony. And again, uh, to all the guest speakers uh, today and also uh, the contributions from our audience uh, and also for attending the questions and comments were also uh, were recorded and they will also be cues for us to continue the conversations. Um, it was a very, very productive session. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge the generous support of the HRC Midlands for Cities doctoral training program, who made this event possible, as I said at the beginning, including the director, Nicola Royan. Um, also, a special thank goes to the research team at Coventry University, Kozer Hussein and Leonor Rodriguez Esteves and Nina Klaff that uh, helped us organize the event and also for the flawless tech support throughout the day. Thank you so much. And finally, to my co-host, uh, Anthony Downey, for the insightful conversations uh, throughout the preparation of these events and the ongoing camaraderie. Um, this is all from me today. I hope you enjoy the event and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks, Carolina. Thank you to everybody. <laughs>